Hi, and welcome to another whiteboard testing video. Uh, today we're going to have an automation angle and we're going to look at something called the data builder pattern. So the data builder pattern was introduced to me, it would have been in 2013, 14 maybe, um, by a guy called Alan Parkinson. Uh, he did a talk about it at the Selenium conference. Uh, and this isn't a truly representative of what he spoke about, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty close. So what it is, is it's simply a pattern for managing data. So most automated checks will have some data in them. They'll need data in order to put that into the application to run the scenario that you're trying to automate and you're trying to check. So what we're going to try and do is I'm using some color-coded blocks instead of writing lots of code. So we're going to try and quickly explain how it works and then we'll look at how you would actually build the code itself. So we have an automated check and in this example it needs a green block, a blue block and a red block. Now, they could represent anything in your system. So, for example, in my current context, the green block could be a user, uh, the red block could be an offer, and the blue block, uh, block could be a gift. That would be the context of my app. Those are objects that exist in my system, in my database. So, it needs one of these. So, what this code will do uh, is very simple. It goes, right, I need a green block. And it goes to this, uh, what we would call the builder code, which we'll, we'll elaborate on down here after. And he goes, I need a green block. And then what this code does, it goes, well, is there a green block in the database? And if there is, well, you might as well have this one. So I'm going to give you that green block. And then it gives it back to the automated check. And then it would use that for its execution. Now, if I said I needed a blue block, it would go to here and say, do you have a blue block? And I can see I don't have a blue block. So what it would do is it would call um, the creator code. And it would create me a blue block. And then it would return me that blue block to my code, which I could then use to run my scenario. So all this date managing of data, obviously it's a good pattern to do this before your actual execution, because you need it for your execution. So this would be done before your scenario runs. And the same with the red block. Do I have one? Yes, I do. And then there's a, an optional part at the end. So the, the really nice thing about this pattern is um, it doesn't rely, it doesn't, always rely on data being there. So you don't have to do a full database teardown before you run and then put one back in, because that can be quite an extensive task. What it does is it just deals with stuff that's already there. If there's something there, I'll give it to you. If there isn't, I'll create it for you, and then you can use it. So you can always build on top of everything that's always there. Now, what you can do afterwards is you could potentially delete it. So if you decided that actually I finished with that user, I don't want it to be in the database anymore, you could call build a code that would delete that object from the database. Um, I personally don't do this. In my context, it's, it's perfectly fine. We've, we've got quite a performance system, and so we can just keep adding data to it. And then, you know, periodically, perhaps every couple of months, maybe we might go and tear down the whole thing and start again. But we don't normally have any issues. We just kind of build on top. Or perhaps more frequently, like weekly, we might tear down certain collections just to reduce the number of offers, let's say, or users. So this bit in the middle, like the bit of magic, how does it work? So it kind of works like this. You have a model. So if it was a user, then you'd have attributes that belong to that user. So they'll have a name, uh, a login, an email address, um, some kind of admin privilege, or some kind of privilege level of some sort. And that's what your model would look like. So then in your code, you would say, I need a new user. And then what you do is you create builders. Now these builders are basically like uh, scenarios or uh, types of the user that you would need. So you would build a builder for an admin. And then what that would do would set the name to John. It would give John an email address and then it would make their privilege admin. So you would say, I want a user. You'd call the builder and you'd say, admin user. And the builder would just create you that object and return it to you. So now you have a an object, a class representation of something that could be in your database. And then what it will do, it will then query, um, which is normally in the creator bit. So what it will do here, it will query, and if there is one, it will return you, it will just say there is one, and return you that object to your code. So now you can use that object throughout your code. So if you were doing a login prompt, you would then say, login page object dot populate username and then you would just put user dot user, user dot um, email or whatever the field was based on your object. Now if there wasn't one, what it would do is it would run a creator and it would actually um, 
build or create the object in your database. Now, the nice thing about the creator is it's a layer of abstraction that um, you can change as you go forward. So let's say you're currently using Mongo. That might be a JavaScript file that you send to Mongo, and Mongo will read that and create you a user. Now let's say your system database that decided to move to SQL. All this code here would stay the same. You would only have to change your creator and make that now be SQL instead of Mongo. So it's a really nice pattern for dealing with change. I know it's very rare that an application switches underlying database, but if it did, you'd be covered and you'd only be having to change this and not the rest of your code. So that, in a nutshell, is pretty much how the data builder works. It's very simple. If there is something there, I want to use that instead because that's quicker, that's less data in my system. If there isn't one there, create me one and give it me back. And then you can decide at the end if you want to delete or not. Uh, I'm going to post some references to the bottom of the, the video in the description. A uh, video from Alan, and then I wrote a blog post about it. And I'll also write um, some pseudo code in uh, GitHub so you can actually see some code and how it looks. So yeah, I, I personally like it. Um, in the future, I'll try and do another video of what you can build on top of this. If you do go down such a route, uh, it can be quite nice to uh, add more interfaces to this code so that people can use it whilst testing, or you can use it in any of your other automated check solutions or frameworks that you might have without having to rewrite it every single time. So yeah, if you've never heard about it before, please check it out. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Cheers. Bye.